us, and we wanted all the young debaters who were at that point looking up to us as you know folks to emulate and whatnot to understand that it was the educational pursuit, that it was the teamwork, that it was the leadership that counted. You know, not whether I went undefeated at this tournament or bombed at that tournament. And and I think Glenn and all of us, I think we did a really good job of one being able to laugh at ourselves and our own problems as we went along. Two, setting a good example for the younger debaters. Three, we did a good job of building a reputation for a national program. I mean, the following year, you guys are gone, left me in the lurch. And <laughs> I can remember it like it was yesterday. We're getting ready to go to the Georgetown tournament, one of the big three tournaments in that day. is over Thanksgiving. And the topic that year for colleges was strengthening law enforcement and battling crime. And I told Glenn, I'm going to write a new case to take to Georgetown, to D.C. And, of course, he said, great. So I bring in this new case, and we're trying out to practice around, and he turns that clock off again. He looks at me and says, now, what term are you taking this case to? I said, Georgetown. <laughs> we're leaving Thursday. Washington, we're going to win the tournament. And he says, I think you need to go back to your old case. No, what do you mean? And, and the case I'd written was the way to strengthen law enforcement is to abolish the FBI. It's racist to the core. Hoover is a corrupt, racist leader in law enforcement. Law enforcement will never improve as long as Hoover's in charge, and he's hired people just like him, and we've got to fire them all and start over. And it was true. Every bit of it was true. Uh, <laughs> and we went 3-0 on the negative and 0-3 on the affirmative at Georgetown. <laughs> he was right. Glenn understood how the world worked and tried to shield us from it while educating us at the same time, really. I, I think that's a powerful segue to the next, next question that I, I like to kind of propose to, to all three of you. you. You've had such meaningful experiences with debate, and it sounds like these opportunities to interact with Mr. Pelham really gave some life skills uh, that you were able to translate to success in, in all three of your lives. Uh, if you could talk to us just a little bit about how debate and those experiences debating in Emory uh, have been informative, have informed your experiences in life, and how do they help you deal with the challenges of life? Because a lot of times we talk about debate uh, and how all the good it did, but how did it also help you negotiate the, the, the tough spots, the rocky areas? College never had any tough spots. Oh, yeah, yeah. The luckiest <laughs> human being in the world. <laughs> I was trying to say, what if I had that? You know. Well, the toughest thing I had was this notion that Charles and I might be twins <laughs> since we graduated at the same time. I hate but to break no. it to you, Cully. Charles is the Mr. Cool who's handsome. You're just trying. <laughs> I cannot accept that. That's why we always wanted female judges, was Charles. Carol knows the truth. <laughs> Carol knows me. What about it, Carol? I have to go with Polly on this. Oh, my goodness. Because of my idea, maybe we can. See, here I am, an honorary clerk, brother, and I'm not even in the competition. Well, early this morning, I was reading this biography on Napoleon, and he said that uh, uh, the historian, which I am, uh, is like the orator. The historian must persuade, the historian must convince. So the fact that I have lived my life as a historian, continually developing what I called much earlier, the vocabulary for problem solving, for understanding conflict, for understanding routes to resolution and all that sort of stuff. Uh, you know, there is nothing like debate that develops it. The stock issues of analysis are common routes to problem solving. And once we learn those common themes and then begin to apply them, every step along the way, we find new ways of bringing it together, providing for solutions, uh, anticipating outcomes and all of that sort of stuff. So there's just no substitute for debate. If you start with that skill set and continue to apply it and elaborate it for the rest of your life, it becomes the rest of your life. Everything that you accomplish grows out of that experience. And so if I write a book, it's because I started thinking about 
how to solve problems, project outcomes, solutions. Well said. Yes, indeed. I'll make it more personal to me. Um, first, about Charles. Uh, I mean, I'm just as close to Cully, but Charles, I just had more contact, really. Uh, I'd say every time in my life that I've felt like I need counsel, I need advice, I need guidance, Charles is the one I've called. Uh, and almost always it's been good advice. Uh, it has been good advice, I'm just trying to get it. Uh, you know, Cully and I spent a great weekend or a couple of days together when he came to Nashville a year ago. And Cully's just like his brother, and Charles is just like his brother. They think alike, they act alike, they have the same integrity. Glenn, when I was a senior again, we graduate, I was trying hard to make my mind go to law school or go get a PhD in communication speech, be a debate coach. And I talked to Glenn, you know, a dozen times about it on debate trips especially, and he was smart. He never said do this or choose that one. Uh, he was too smart to do that. Uh, you know, he asked me the right questions that made me think my way through it. And, and the one other thing I would say for the history of this program is, Glenn took us to a debate tournament in Vanderbilt. I think it was with you, so your senior year, my junior year, and the coaches went to a luncheon in the middle of the debate tournament. And I can remember walking over where Glenn's walking out of the luncheon, and you know, we're gonna talk about how the rounds have gone. He said, no, 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 I wanna tell you about this speech we just heard from this English professor, professor named Aiden on the Vanderbilt faculty, English faculty Vanderbilt was the most conservative in the nation, or in the running sword in those days. And Aiden had gotten up and blasted President Johnson and the war on poverty, philosophically and every other way, and talked specifically about, isn't this ridiculous? They're now gonna fund a program to provide legal aid for the poor. Have you ever heard of anything so outlandish? So Glenn's saying to me, I had no idea, this is great. We need to write the president, encourage him. We need to spread the word that the world really can change through legal rights for poor people. Uh, so when I graduated law school, I went to work for Atlanta Legal Aid. Uh, no question where I was coming from there. And the other component there is also debate. Again, we were fighting our way up the whole, our whole debate careers in college. We were the underdog. So I've spent 43 years practicing law representing underdogs. I represented uh, everybody on death row in Tennessee. I represented everybody in the mental retardation institution. This week, I decided to represent everybody in another mental retardation center. I've represented all the students in various school systems and desegregation cases. I've, I've lived a life of law representing the underdog and good people. Uh, and, this, and it's easy for me to trace back, track exactly where that kind of lifetime and attitudes come from. And, and it's because of hanging out with these guys and being mentored and guided by Glenn Pelham. Yeah. I think uh, debate, more than anything else, <clears throat> informed my desire to teach. Whether it was as a high school teacher, which I did for five or six years, or whether it was as an administrator of a, a regulatory program in the state of Georgia where a significant component of what we did was to teach people how to comply with the law. And I think all of that was informed by what I learned in debate. I don't ever remember a day going by when I had to write something that I didn't go back to the writing style that I had as a debater and how I would organize arguments and how I would present them, always remembering that the most important thing is the last thing you say. Uh, the first point just sets up the rest. And there should always just be three ideas. Nobody can handle more than three ideas. And I found out that really was true. Mm -hmm. I gave several speeches where I tried to give five to ten ideas. My brother Cully heard one of them. And he wanted, why did you go on like that? You know, and, and the, the fundamentals of debate are, are basic for us and can carry us through to do whatever it is we want to do. 
if it involves communicating with other people. <clears throat> well, I appreciate your time, and I and I and I think we all have been enriched by the words that you shared with us. Um, if you could, though, there are going to be a whole bunch of a new generation of, of young people, debaters, uh, folks that I think that want to make a difference in the world, move the needle. Uh, what would you say to those young people in terms of uh, either words of wisdom or things that they should remember going forth, either as it relates to debate or lessons that you've kind of learned that you've garnered up to this point in your life? Well, Aristotle defined uh, rhetoric as the available means of persuasion in a given case. And the question has always been, what did he mean by available? And what he meant was, it is in your audience. That's the only thing that you can avail of in order to persuade the audience, which means that message better be centered in the audience's experiences. So if you're talking to urban kids, you know, you've got to know what they know, what they've experienced, and then center that message in that so they'll have something to re relate it to. And so I think that persuasive discourse, growing out of argument, critical thinking, and the like, always needs to keep audience as primary because it's only they who will leave the room instructed, better equipped, but you've got to be thinking about them and what they're able to do and think. I think what I've learned from debate, debating and coaching over the years, is to persevere in alternative thinking. You know, we all know that strategy in debate. I've got four different ways I can go in responding to this argument. So you learn to think in the alternative. And, and that's a good attitude for life. You know, all of life's problems and bumps that we never anticipate, if, if you're used to thinking in alternatives and persevering, you're gonna do pretty well with those bumps that you weren't looking forward to, I think. Uh, Melissa Maxey, otherwise known as Melissa Wade, we've been talking about Glenn Pelham. I coached Melissa Wade as Glenn's assistant for two years, and I can't take credit for her talent. She was probably the most talented young debater in college uh, that I ever encountered. She already had all the tools and generally knew how to use them, etc. But every Wednesday night, since she was the young debater and I was the assistant, I was in there judging her and her practice round against the other team, she and Lily Correa usually. And I can remember the first night I kept her there two hours and started with A and went to Z. You did everything wrong. And, and she'll tell you about it. She didn't like that a bit. She wasn't used to that, and I don't blame her. And boy, her learning curve went straight up from that. She was gonna prove me wrong. She was gonna persevere until she persuaded me that she was the best thing in the world of debate, which she became. And not due to my credit, due to her hard work. Uh, but I think perseverance and the way you learn to think strategically is what young people and new debaters can do and look forward to using as a life skill in their entire life. Always do the very best that you think you can. And always remember that when you have done that, that it can be improved. And you just have to identify how and improve it the next time. <clears throat> Well, we thank you all there uh, and appreciate uh, carving out some time to, to share these, these memories and these stories and, and words of wisdom. I don't know if there's anything else you would like to add, but uh, we just appreciate all the, the continued support that you provide in the, in the path that you've blazed uh, so that so many other young people can walk behind you and uh, hopefully have the road a little bit easier. Uh, and an easier path for them to kind of go down. So yeah, y'all um, far exceeded anything we ever did, and I'm glad yes, we were absolutely. part of it. I mean, you yes, know, the, it was the handoff that uh, yeah. uh, made the yeah. difference. It was, uh, and if we were a part of that, we're. Do do we get to tell the story about Bill Aver splitting his pants? 
Was that right? <laughs> was that right before the television camera came <laughs> on in the final round at Kentucky? Yeah, it was something like that. But uh, the the real memory there is of our heading off to some distant world and. I'm driving up what would become I-75 and all that sort of stuff. And I pull out because I was the driver. I pull out and Ava and Charles and Larry are in the back seat, usually asleep. But I pull out and make a pass. And there was a big truck coming on the other side. Brink's thing. armored car truck. Brink, yeah, he remembers it well. And then this voice from the back said, we are not going to make it. We did. We did. <laughs> if the paint, if the paint had been this much thicker, we would not have made it. Let me tell you, a it's a life-searing memory. A Studebaker <laughs> Lark is no match for a Brink Storm. <laughs> <laughs> <truck. laughs> Not too many different vehicles are. <laughs> but we made it. We survived, and we lived in wonderful times that uh, I would not take anything for. I agree. Glad, glad that I grew up with the movement. Uh, that we call civil rights. I'm glad that my life covered this stretch of time. And uh, I can say one thing about Selma again, and that is on Bloody Sunday, which is March 7, 1965, when we were about to graduate, uh, I know exactly where I was because I had walked down to my fraternity house, ATO, to watch the ABC Sunday night movie. You know what movie it was? Judgment at Nuremberg. And during that movie, ABC broke in to show what was happening on the Edmund Pettus Bridge. That juxtaposition in that moment was not only riveting, it was transformational for the nation. So these moments we have lived and had the opportunity to engage is so instructive of the value of debate and what you make of it. Damn, he's okay. pretty good. He is. He's good. Real good. Someone must have taught this guy how to argue. I'm almost glad he's